one of the reasons that uh, preventive war didn't take place um, with the Germans, the French wanted to uh, engage in war, and the, and the Brits um, sort of shot them down. Um, and I want to challenge your interpretation of why, why um, the British decided not to um, engage in that. Now, you're, um, you're saying that their understanding of the strategic consequences was a little bit more sober in some ways, that they saw that, that they had a better understanding of the preventive war paradox, that they weren't going to achieve a more lasting peace, they weren't going to be able to um, achieve their political objectives by allowing the French or by supporting the French in a, a preventive war um, into the Rhineland. But um, you know, Churchill's phrase, thank God for the French military, maybe it's just easier because Britain is physically more removed. So they're, it's easy for them to say, okay, engage in this if you want to, but we're, we're not going to support it, um, and just leave it up to the French because they're on the front lines and the British can hang back because physically they're just removed from it. So they have less risk. Um, so it's, it's easy for them to, to opt out. The, 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 uh, the Germans aren't on their doorstep. So it, it's one kind of fear versus an, another in that sense. How do you respond that, to that? That's a very good point. So let me just fill in some of the historic context uh, of behind this particular moment in time. The, the key moment that I'm looking at is 1936, and it's the so-called Rhineland Crisis of, of March of 1936. If you go back to the Versailles Treaty that ends World War I, the Germans were prohibited from maintaining any military forces to the west of the Rhine River. If you look, think about the map of Germany, the Rhine River flows from the south to, to the north, cuts off about a third of, of Germany uh, that borders France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and, and the Netherlands. The Germans were prohibited from maintaining any military forces, developing bases, any kind of exercises within the Rhineland, west of the Rhine River, and this 50 kilometer strip to the east of the Rhine River. And the idea was, this was driven by France. France desperately wanted this buffer zone coming out of World War I for obvious reasons. And this was a great shock to their overall strategy to try to keep Germany indefinitely suppressed as the best route toward European peace and, and French security. So I think you're right in that we can explain the difference in the level of fear between France and Britain because of geography and because of history. So I get it. I understand very well why the French government was willing in March of 1936 when Hitler made a surprise announcement and moved a relatively small force west of the Rhine River, created a big crisis, and the French were willing to go. They were willing to use a military uh, offensive with the operational objective of pushing the German force back across the Rhine River and restoring the demilitarized zone. And they made this, though, fully contingent on British political support, at least. And the British vetoed this. So I, I can understand simultaneously why the French preventive war temptation was much higher than the British. But when you go back and you look at the documents and you look at how British leaders across the spectrum were thinking about the problem, they were worried about what do we actually set in motion? We're actually going to guarantee another great war. And the consensus position in Great Britain in 1936 was not the way we see it today with hindsight. There was no clarity on what Adolf Hitler was going to do and the fact that they were going to confront a second world war, whatever they, they wanted to do. Um, and they believed they were just going to guarantee a war. Um, and that comes very clearly through the documents. So the British thought, in a sense, that this ticking time bomb was embedded, in a way, in the Versailles Treaty. Um, and so there, there's an idea that at some point there's going to be some kind of confrontation around that. So perhaps um, preventive war is delaying, in a sense, um, the other side's ability to build up their power to a greater extent. Maybe that's the best military or strategic outcome you can hope for in the immediate term. Maybe, I mean, it's not ideal, but it's better than allowing them to continue to build up unopposed. That's absolutely right. Um, everything hinges on your assessment of the likelihood that they're actually going to act aggressively in the future. So clearly by 1938, even you know, after the Munich Agreement and, and a, a, a very serious shift in the tone of the German government in late 1938. By late 1938, there was a consensus position in Great Britain crystallizing very quickly 
that we have, we have reached a tipping point and we need to confront the German government because uh, it's the only option we have to try to deter, contain, or, or at least defend ourselves against what looks like uh, a threat that's coming. But again, in 1936, what is your assessment of the likelihood of future war if you choose that option that you just described? This is actually the way the, the Israelis describe it today. Uh, the Israelis use this, uh, this phrase, mowing the grass. And it's a very simple analogy. We all understand what happens with your lawn. You mow your lawn to cut it back. The lawn grows. You just cut it back again. And the Israelis have this concept they still work with today that each time a, a pocket of, of power among rivals around Israel continues to grow, you conduct some kind of a military attack to cut the grass. And that may be the best situation you have if you believe that if you allow the grass to continue to grow, it's going to lead to a catastrophic conflict in the future. What you should also be concerned about, however, is whether or not the grass is going to grow back with nuclear blades, right? Because human beings are not grass. Grass is an an inanimate object. So to me, the metaphor only goes so far. And the reaction of your target isn't necessarily going to be, oh, well, let's try it again. Let's just continue to build up. They may make political decisions that take them to a place in which they desire capabilities they didn't desire before. Okay, I guess we do need a nuclear weapon now, which is what Iraq said after the Israeli attack in 1981, not before the Israeli attack. Um, or uh, I think we need to ratchet this up. So that's, that would be my warning. That How long can you sustain a mowing the grass strategy until it really backfires in a worse way than if you had just tried to contain the threat through deterrence and balance of power. Mm-hmm.